Hello, and thank you for joining us for Ohio Medicaid Basics 2023. I'm Alana Clark-Kirk, the Education and Communications Manager at HPIO. Our mission is to advance evidence-informed policies that improve health, achieve equity, and lead to sustainable healthcare spending. This year, we are celebrating HPIO's 20th anniversary. Thank you to our core funders who support HPIO's mission with their steadfast investment in our work. We'd also like to thank our 2023 Educational Event Series sponsors who make events like today's webinar possible. We encourage you to put questions in the chat or in the Q&A box during the webinar. These slides and other information shared today will be on the HPIO website under the category Events. Medicaid provides healthcare coverage for millions of Ohioans. HPIO has released Ohio Medicaid Basics every two years since 2005. The primary author of the 2023 edition, Adit Nkinyani, will provide an overview of Ohio's Medicaid program. We have two guest speakers joining us. Patrick Beatty from the Ohio Department of Medicaid will provide an update on the redetermination process in Ohio. And Libby Hinton with KFF will discuss how Medicaid can be leveraged to address social drivers of health. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Adit, who is a health policy analyst with HPIO to get us started. Thank you, Alana. Um, again, my name is Adit Nkengani, and I'll be providing a quick overview of our 2023 Ohio Medicaid basics on the Ohio Medicaid program. Next, please. Could you go? Thank you. Um, there are three key findings for policymaker from the 2023 Medicaid Basics publication. And those are that one, Ohio Medicaid Basics. Uh, Ohio Medicaid provides healthcare coverage for about 3.55 million Ohioans with low incomes, most of whom are children, older adults, people with disability, and low income adults who could not otherwise afford private or employer-sponsored health insurance. Two, uh, Medicaid is a significant share of gov government spending in Ohio. It accounts for about 39%, which is about $35 billion of the state spending in state fiscal year 2022. Though the federal government reimbursed the state for um for about 73% of that spending. Uh, the last key finding is that the Ohio Department of Medicaid is in the process of implementing several large-scale program changes in 2023. This includes the implementation of the next generation of Ohio Medicaid managed care. Uh, also, they are in the process of conducting Medicaid redetermination Patrick Beatty will provide more updates on how that process is going later in the webinar. Next, please. As of January 2023, 30% or 3.55 million people in Ohio were enrolled in Medicaid, most of whom fall under the covered families and children category. I will talk more about that category later. Ohio Ohioans who depend on Medicaid have trouble accessing or affording other types of health insurance coverage, such as insurance provided through the employer. Next, please. Uh, now let's talk about a little bit about um, Medicaid eligibility. To the left, you will see the very uh, basic requirement for one to be for someone to be eligible for Medicaid, which is that. You have to be an Ohio resident, have a social security number, or have applied for one, be a U.S. citizen, or meet the requirements for a non-U.S. citizen. Uh, in the middle of the eligibility group, uh, for example, uh, for the children group, uh, the income, the household income has to be 211% 
or less of the federal poverty level for a child to qualify for Medicaid. And children, parents, and pregnant women have fall under one category, which is the cover families and children. And adults fall under the group eight category and older Ohioans and those who have who are blind or disabled fall under the age blind and disabled category. Next, please. All right, so now let's take a look at how that federal poverty, um, that income eligibility breaks down. Uh, for example, if I'm an adult in a household by myself, I have to be making $20,120 dollars or less in order to qualify for Medicaid. Uh, if the, um, a child is in the household with three people, including that child, the income um, has to be $52,455 or less annually uh, for that child to qualify for Medicaid. Next, please. Uh, so here are the main uh, Medicaid uh, groups. Uh, the first one is that covered families and children. And the people who fall under that group um, are children, pregnant women, and parents. And group eight in the middle um, is for adult ages 19 to 64 with income at or below 100, 138% of the federal poverty level. And lastly, the age blind and disabled group um uh the the there's the ugh. lastly is the age blind and disabled group and the people who fall under that are people over the age of 65 people living with disability and medicaid by and for workers with disability next please medicaid and medicare um are uh, different in that Medicaid uh, is for low-income people and is funded by both the federal and state governments, whereas Medicare is typically for the adults and it is funded solely by the federal government through payroll deduction from employers, uh, employees, and self-employed people. Uh, Medicare eligibility is based on worker history and age or disability status and there is not an income limit for Medicare coverage. Uh, Ohio, uh, some Ohioans who are enrolled in Medicaid under the age blind and disabled categories are duly eligible for both Medicare, Medicaid and Medicare. Next, please. As I mentioned earlier, Medicaid provides healthcare coverage for people with low income, and there are several reasons why people enroll in Medicaid. These include unemployment, changes in household income, being a caregiver uh, for another person, including leaving a job to provide care to a relative or a friend, changes to household composition, including death of a partner or divorce, high cost of private individual health insurance, which is difficult for many families to access. Also, some people are in need of long-term services and support, like the services provided through nursing facilities. Those services are not covered by Medicare or other types of private health insurance. Next, please. Now let's take a look at some of the covered services that Medicaid provides. The federal government requires state to cover certain services, but states can decide to provide additional services. To the left are uh, the services that the federal government requires each state to provide. And to the right, it's a list of optional services that Ohio provides. Uh, this is not a comprehensive list. Uh, for example, the federal government requires services, uh, or requires state to uh, provide uh, services such as inpa inpa inpatient, inpatient and outpatient hospital services, nursing facility services, and home health services. Optional services that Ohio provides includes dental and vision care, prescription drugs, 
and behavioral and mental health services. Next, please. Medica uh, Medicaid services are provided through the seven managed care plans in Ohio or through fee for service payments. Managed care plans are privately operated health insurance companies that contract with providers such as physicians and hospitals to provide Medicaid services to people enrolled in the program. For the fee for service uh, system, Medicaid reimburses each provider for services rendered. As of February of 2023, 89.1% of Ohioans utilizing Medicaid were enrolled through a managed care plan. Uh, while 6.8% were enrolled in the fee-for-service system and 4.1% were enrolled in the limited coverage category. Medicaid provider rates are typically lower than the rates paid by Medicare or commercial health insurance plans, which reduces the cost of the program, but can also limit access because some providers do not accept Medicaid. Next, please. Wait just a minute. Oh, no, you're fine, you're <laughs> fine, sorry. All right, let's get you on your next slide. Okay, thank you. Um, and the, uh, just going back to that covered families and um, children category, uh, overall, the group accounts for about 54% of Medicaid enrollment in Ohio, 64.4%, um, 66.4% uh, of people enrolled are children, whereas 33.6% uh, are adults. Next, please. Next, please. Oh, sorry, can you go back up? Sorry. Can you go back up one? Thank you. Um, down one again. That's okay. All right, thank you. Uh, so here's the graph just showing you the percentage of people enrolled in Medicaid by the different category. Uh, starting at the top, the ABD is for uh, urge, blind, and disabled. Uh, the CF C is the covered families and children. Group eight is that expansion group and other are uh, those limited uh, coverage and services uh, group. Uh, for the urge, blind, and disabled, they account for about 48% of the expenditure, Medicaid expenditure in Ohio. Uh, this group tends to have more acute and long-term care needs. Many of the healthcare uh, services that this group receive through Medicaid are usually available through, are usually not available through uh, health, private health insurance and are too expensive to afford out of pocket. This is especially true for long-term care in community settings and nursing facilities. Next, please. And now let's talk a little bit about Medicaid enrollment trends over the years. Um, Medicaid enrollment increased between 2014 and 16 due in part to the Medicaid uh, expansion. Enrollment decreased between 2017 and 19. However, the state witnessed a sharp increase in enrollment starting in 2020, um, which is when the COVID-19 public health emergency was declared. Increase in enrollment between 20 23, uh, 2020 and 2023 reflects changes in the economy and the temporal continuous uh, enrollment policy that the federal government instituted at the start of the public health emergency. This policy bars state from disenrolling people from Medicaid. Okay, next please. And uh, 
now let, now let's talk a little bit about how Medicaid uh, is funded in Ohio. The federal uh, Medicaid is a joint partnership between the federal and the state uh, government. And the federal government reimburses state for Medicaid expenditures through a payment arrangement called the Federal Medical Assistance Percentage, also known as FMAP. Through the FMAP arrangement, state are reimbursed by the federal government for healthcare services provided. The rate of reimbursement depends on each state per capita income. States are eligible for increased reimbursement for some children and for people that are enrolled in the Group 8 category. Next, please. And this uh, circle graph just basically show you the breakdown of uh, expenditure based on uh, the state funding and federal funding. The federal government finance a significant portion of Medicaid. The total spending on Ohio Medicaid program in the state fiscal year 2022 was $35 billion and the federal government share of that was $25.7 billion, which is about 73%. Ohio general revenue, which is made of, uh, up of Ohio income tax revenue contributed 15% to Medicaid, and the remaining 12% came from non-general revenue funds, which includes fees paid by hospital, healthcare insurance companies, and nursing home facilities. Next, please. Uh, over the years, as you can see, uh, Medicaid spending has uh, gone up. However, the state has uh, spent re relatively uh, the same for Medicaid, while the federal government has uh, taken up most, most of that increase in costs. Also, if you, as you see, in 2020, we saw a, a little a more increase in Medicaid, and that was due to uh, the COVID-19 pandemic as well. Next, please. Now let's take a closer look at how the COVID-19 pandemic impacted enrollment. During the COVID-19 pandemic, in, uh, Medicaid enrollment went up by 27.7% from March of 2020 to January of 2023. To support state during the healthcare, uh, during the public health emergency, the federal government provided additional 6.2% increase in the federal medical average uh, assistant percentage, which is the FMAP. Again, uh, the federal government also restricted state from disenrolling anybody from Medicaid. Uh, this continuous enrollment uh, policy ended in April, and now this, uh, the federal government is implementing an incremental phase down of the enhanced FMAP that was provided at the start of the public health emergency, and that will be uh, implemented throughout the rest of this year. Next, please. Now let's take a closer look at what is going on in Ohio and the different projects that are going on in Ohio Medicaid. The Ohio Department of Medicaid has been implementing many components of the next generation of Ohio Medicaid managed care. Uh, next, genera next generation, which is popularly called next gen, is aimed at streamlining administrative processes, increasing transparency, and improving care access and coordination. I will be talking about the three major components from next gen. Uh, the first one being the procurement of the managed care organization, which went live in February of this year. The new contracts with the managed care organization ensure better care coordination and benefit provision, as well as increased transparency. Uh, the second uh, initiative is the single pharmacy benefit manager, which uh, manages prescription drugs benefit for Ohioan enroll in Medicaid. Uh, that went live in October of 2022 with Gainwell Technology as the vendor. 
Uh, the last one is Ohio Resilience Through Integrated System and Excellence, also known as Ohio RICE. Ohio RICE is responsible for providing, managing, and coordinating behavioral health uh, health care for youth with complex behavioral health needs. Ohio RISE was launched in July of 2022. The Department of Medicaid is still implementing different components of next gen, but the uh, procurement of the managed care organization, uh, single pharmacy benefit manager, and the launch of Ohio RISE are the big components. Next, please. Uh, just to summarize uh, my overview again, uh, here are the three key findings from the 2023 Ohio Medicaid basics. The first being that Ohio, Ohio uh, Medicaid provides healthcare coverage for about 3.55 million Ohioans with low incomes. Uh, Medicaid accounts for about 39% of the state spending with a large portion of that uh, money coming from the federal government. And the Ohio Department of Medicaid is currently implementing many extensive changes, including the next generation of Ohio uh, managed care and also uh, conducting eligibility determination. And next, please. I just provided you a very quick summary of the Medicaid program. There's still, still so much to learn. So here are some resources that you can use to further your knowledge on Medicaid. If you have any question, you're welcome to reach out to me and I will be happy to help you. Are there any questions in the chat for me, Amy? Well, there are many questions in the chat. So I think what we'll do is continue to respond to those okay. in the chat or the Q&A box as we move along to our next speaker, Patrick Davey. Um, and Patrick, we may need to call upon you to assist us with some of these questions because some of them are um, very nuanced. Um, and or we may end up putting some general resources in the Q&A or chat boxes um, to give folks some more resources that they can follow to answer those more detailed questions. Sounds good. Mm -hmm. So thank, thank you so much, Edith, for your presentation. Um, first, we're going to, we're just going to take a quick moment here to respond to our first two poll questions. Um, so we would like to get your feedback here on um, whether so far this forum has increased your knowledge of Ohio's Medicaid program. And then also we would love to know your thoughts or feedback on the presentation you just heard from Adit. If you could please take a moment to respond to those questions, it would be helpful for us as we um, work to improve and enhance our forums. We have quite a robust registration for today's forum. Uh, we have over, over 500 folks here on the webinar this afternoon. We appreciate all of you joining us. Uh, Medicaid is a quite complex program um, and someone who I know appreciates that more than most is Patrick Beatty who is the Deputy Director and Chief Policy Officer at the Ohio Department of Medicaid. Um, Patrick, how many years all toll have you had in state government and or the Department of Medicaid? Uh, let's see, I started with state government in 1992, Ooh. and that was in the Attorney General's office. Um, I started working on Medicaid cases Oh, I want to say 1997, 98, somewhere around there. Um, doing a lot of provider audit stuff, Medicaid mm -hmm. eligibility cases, appeals and litigation and that kind of stuff. Then moved into in-house counsel for the Department of Job and Family Services when Medicaid was still a department there, the vision there. Um, became the Deputy Director um, and Policy Chief 
in, I want to say 2010, mm -hmm. during Kasich's first term. Yeah. Stayed there till the end of, not quite the end of 2014, went into the private sector, um, variety of different jobs in the private sector uh, with uh, AIDS Research Center Ohio mm -hmm. and with Kaiser Permanente down in Atlanta for a couple of years. And then uh, came back in the beginning of 2019. And uh, I'm just loving it here. <laughs> well, that's great. We're very fortunate to have you at the Ohio Department of Medicaid. Um, it is such a, a complex program. And I, I know that you um, are among the most well-respected and knowledgeable people in our state on the topic of Medicaid. We're looking forward to hearing your insight on how things are unfolding in Ohio with the unwinding of the public health emergency and redetermination processes. So I'll hand it off to you now. Uh, certainly, why don't we uh, kick off some slides here? Okay, great, um, Alana's got that. All right, so cover slide, ah, there we are. So take a, a step back in time, uh, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, um, as the last presentation covered, uh, states were required to maintain eligibility for individuals uh, and not disenroll them uh, with a few exceptions. Uh, if an individual passed away, moved out of state or requested to be disenrolled. Otherwise, states were required to maintain enrollment of individuals in the Medicaid program. And that went on for the duration of the pandemic. The Consolidated Appropriations Act in 2023, at the very, uh, at the very end of 2022 uh, was passed and it delinked the pandemic or the public health emergency from the continuous coverage provisions. And it required that states commence uh, the re-review or renewal process of Medicaid eligibility for all members in the program, including some individuals that may not have been renewed since uh, March of 2020. Uh, states were required to do this in a speci specified time frame. Uh, we here in Ohio initiated the return to routine operations in February of 23. We are going to uh, do redeterminations for eligibility on 3.5 million Medicaid members between February 23 and April of 2024. The work in preparing for um, this uh, project that many states refer to as unwinding um, I refer to it as the resumption of normal eligibility uh, process. But this, this unwinding uh, preparation actually began at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, we took a hard look at our system structures, our operations, um, our policies to evaluate, you know, what was going to be the most effective means of achieving this successfully. We made significant changes in systems and operations and policy to uh, accommodate that. And uh, in uh, 2022, uh, we began trainings and webinars for county workers, partner, partner entities and organizations, health plans, and other key stakeholders to publicize the changes to Medicaid eligibility operations. Um, we are accountable to the Federal Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, uh, that's CMS. Uh, and we're also accountable to the Ohio General Assembly. Those two have expectations on how we are to complete renewals in a timely manner, uh, to meet a target completion date, um, and that failure to complete timely processing and accurate processing of renewals could result in financial penalties to Ohio Medicaid. So it was really important to us that when we set this up, we set it up right. And that required a lot of input from a lot of different organizations, 
uh, both in the state and out of the state um, to really structure a framework that was going to succeed. So next slide. So here are some of the federal requirements uh, uh, that relate to the FMAP, the FMAP funding, the Federal Me Medi uh, Medical Assistance Percentage Funding. So as a condition of receiving enhanced federal medical assistance percentage, we have to comply with federal requirements established in the CAA um, during our return, re re return to routine eligibility operations. So to continue to receive the FMAP through December 31st of this year, all states have to continue to meet certain conditions. Those include maintenance of effort, which means we can't impose eligibility standards, methodologies, or procedures that are more restrictive than those in effect on January 1, 2020. Maintenance of Medicaid premium levels uh, and coverage without cost sharing for COVID-19 testing, vaccines, and treatment. CMS has also added new conditions for states to receive the increased FMAP. Those include compliance with federal renewal requirements, including regulations regarding ex parte renewals, renewal forms, reasonable timeframes, and modalities to return the renewal form, determination of eligibility on all bases, uh, advanced notice and fair hearing rights, assessment of eligibility for other insurance affordability programs like the marketplace, and transfer accounts as appropriate to the marketplace as well as the application of what we call the reconsideration period. That's where an individual, if they're found ineligible or discontinued for non-response, has a 90-day period to reconnect to their caseworker and have their case reopened. We have to maintain up-to-date contact information. So the states must attempt to update the contact information for every individual going through the renewal process. That includes beneficiary's mailing address, phone number, and email address. CMS has asked states to consider various sources for this information and have a plan to con confirm the information is up to date and have attempted to update the information recently and document their strategies to obtain the updated information. We have enlisted the assistance of managed care plans, uh, as well as care management entities in an effort to obtain updated addresses. And as we, as we obtain those and verify those, uh, we, as we obtain those and verify those, uh, we update our eligibility enrollment system. Uh, we have to contact beneficiaries using more than one modality prior to terminating enrollment on the basis of return mail. So the states are required to make a good faith effort to contact individuals when they receive the return mail. And we have to have a process to obtain updated mailing address and additional contact information and must attempt to reach an individual through at least two, two modalities. So we have, uh, we have a variety of modalities that we're using to contact individuals. Those include um, text messaging, uh, IVR call systems, mail, and email. Currently, the temporary increased FMAP is 6.2%. It's actually now effective April 1 is down to 5%. Uh, starting July 1, it'll drop to 2.5%. And between August and December 31st, it's 1.5%. After that, it returns to normal FMAP. Next slide. So this is uh, this is actually available on our website. Um, and this is a, a timeline that represented the commencement of the resuming of routine renewal operations. So there's a, a variety of different seminal events that are marked on this. And it starts with December of 22. Um, and that would be uh, the uh, end of the pandemic and the passage of the CAA. Um, 
And that authorized states beginning in February of 23 to resume routine operations. Terminations could not take place uh, until April. And for many states, the eligibility review process is actually a multi-month event. It is not just opening a case file, looking at it, and making a decision. States are required to run eligibility renewal cases through a variety of steps. Uh, it starts with the commencement of on the bottom in the maroon colored uh, sequence are the sequences or events that eligibility reviews go through for each uh, month. Starts with ex parte renewal process where the system attempts to verify the individual's eligibility based on information in the system, as well as information external to the system like uh, income sources and that kind of information. If the system is not able to renew somebody automatically through ex parte, the state is sharing the list of those individuals with our vendor, PCG, uh, as well as partners, uh, Medicaid managed care organizations, AAAs, and care management entities. Those at organizations are doing outreach to these individuals to let them know that they're going to be getting a renewal packet, requesting verifications, and advising them on how to respond to those. Uh, they'll also they're also gathering updated addresses for these individuals at that time. Our vendor PCG conducts data matching on external data sources that we don't traditionally or haven't historically used to identify individuals as likely eligible or likely ineligible. We use that to further facilitate county caseworker review of the cases with the additional documentation and data and information available as a result of that review. Uh, renewal packets are mailed to members who are not renewed through ex parte. Um, IVR calls are made to members to let them know that they're gonna be getting renewal packets and to encourage them to respond. If they don't respond, reminder notices are sent and mailed to individuals. Subsequent IVR calls are also made at this point in time uh, in an effort to reach the individuals. Um, renewal packets would be due. Um, and if individuals do not respond, um, then their cases will be discontinued and notices will be issued. Uh, once the notice is issued, the coverage for the individual would end on the first day of the following month. Next slide. So, <clears throat> as I indicated, we began our resuming normal operations in February. The system is designed to take a case and begin ex parte review two months in advance of the individual's annual renewal date. So our February activity was focused on cases that had a renewal review date in April. So we now have enough time has passed that we have the results for April and May of 2023. And I'll be doing a quick overview of what those look like by the numbers. Next slide. So this is a, a screenshot of a segment of a report. These reports contain the data that we report to CMS. Um, these reports are also available on our website to the public. Um, and contain various other information. But as it relates to the renewal process, uh, for those cases that were due in April, here are the statistics. Um, for the total beneficiaries, individuals who were due for renewal in the reporting period was 220,961. Um, of those who were up for renewal, um, 152,416 were retained on Medicaid and retained their eligibility. That breakdown of that group comprised of the following. 111,000 of them were renewed through ex parte. 
41,000 were renewed using pre-populated renewal forms. Of the beneficiaries in this group, the number of individuals determined ineligible were 9,869. Uh, the number of individuals who were terminated for procedural reasons, primarily failure to respond to the renewal packets, was 36,000. We're working to reduce that rate of non-response. Uh, at the end of the month of April, uh, of those cases that were due in that month, only 22,000 had yet to be processed. Next slide. Here's a similar um, representation. This is for the month of May, individuals who had their eligibility review date due in the month of May. There were slightly more, 240,000, uh, 241,000 were due in the month of May. Of those, 165,894 were retained on Medicaid. The breakdown of those renewals were 122,000 ex parte renewals and 43,000 through pre-populated forms. 13,000 were found ineligible and 34,000 uh, were terminated for procedural reasons. And that left about 27,000 individuals who had yet to be processed by the end of the month of May. We have some takeaways from this. Next slide. So for the first two months, the ex parte renewals were running at a roughly 50%. We know that based on changes in the enrollment numbers and the individuals who are due for renewal, the number of and percent of ex parte renewals will increase in the subsequent months starting in starting for individuals whose due date was June. Uh, we know, based on experience, um, that uh, the ex parte rates vary across eligibility categories. ABD groups have a higher rate of renewal than, than what was described as CFC groups, or um, MAGI, Modified Adjusted Gross Income. We know that 90% of the renewal cases are being processed timely. Uh, we know monthly percentiles, 70% of the individuals who are up for renewal retain their coverage. These are approximate numbers, rounded. 15% uh, of individuals lose coverage for procedural reasons. There was a question in the chat, give an example of a procedural reason. So if an individual can't be renewed through ex parte, uh, and they are sent a uh, renewal packet with a request, a verification request checklist. Uh, it could be asking for things like verify your income for us. If they don't respond to that renewal request um, after multiple uh, outreach attempts, then their case will be closed for non-response. That's a procedural reason. 5% uh, of the individuals are being transferred to the federal marketplace for processing and potential coverage um, under uh, a qualified health plan in the federal marketplace. So those are our observations. And uh, that, I believe, is the last slide. Don't know if there are any other questions out there. Thank you, Patrick. That, that was very helpful and interesting to hear how things are going there. Um, we do have some questions in the chat. If you have a few minutes to stick around um, and respond to some of those, that would be most appreciated. I, I, will, I will try to respond. Do you want me to respond in the chat? Yeah, that, that would be great, especially those are, that are relevant to what you just presented. Um, there are both questions in the Q&A and in the chat. And, and some of them, might you might have actually answered them in the course of your presentation. Okay. But th thank you so much for that update. My pleasure. All right. Okay, we're going to move on to our next speaker. 
who is Libby Hinton. As I mentioned earlier, she is with KFF, where she is in the role of Associate Director of the Program on Medicaid and the Uninsured. Good afternoon, Libby. Hi, Amy. Thanks so much for having me today. Well, thanks for joining us. Oh, and wait, was I supposed to do a poll there, um, Alana? We'll do it after Libby's finished. Okay, great. Okay, go ahead, Libby. Okay, great. <laughs> Can you, oh great, thanks for queuing up the slides. Okay, so thanks so much for inviting me to join uh, the webinar today. In my presentation, I'm going to cover at a high level the primary authorities and flexibilities that can be used to add benefits and design programs to address um, Medicaid and release social determinants of health. In particular, I'm going to spend some time highlighting new opportunities available to states to address social determinants through demonstration waiver authority and through managed care authority. You may hear me use different terms and acronyms during the presentation, including social determinants of health or social drivers, as well as health-related social needs, which is a term used by federal officials at CMS currently. Next slide, please. Though healthcare is essential to health, we know that health outcomes are driven by many factors, including social, economic, and environmental factors. Studies suggest that health behaviors and social and economic factors like employment, housing, and food security are primary drivers of health outcomes. Within the health sector, initiatives to address social determinants have been launched at the federal, state, and local levels, and by health plans and providers, including efforts within Medicaid. Next slide. Generally, states have not been able to use federal Medicaid funds to pay the direct costs of services like housing and food. However, states can use some Medicaid authorities to cover certain non-medical services. Historically, non-medical services have been included as part of Medicaid Home and Community-Based Services Waivers, HCBS for short, um, that serve people with disabilities or chronic illnesses, who need help with self-care or um, activities of daily living. Services covered in these programs have included employment supports, housing supports, nutrition supports, non-medical transportation, among others. Outside of HCBS programs, states have had more limited options to cover these non-medical services. I've outlined these options at a high level on the slide. For example, states can add benefits like peer supports, um, and case management services under state plan authority, which can help with care coordination and linkages to social supports and social services. States can request federal funds under Section 1115 waiver authority, and I'll talk more about that demonstration authority in a few minutes. Managed care plans have some limited flexibility to pay for non-medical services, and states may include certain requirements targeting enrollee social needs as part of managed care contract procurements and contract requirements generally. Finally, Medicaid payment and delivery system reforms like ACO models and patient-centered medical homes may provide flexibility or opportunities to cover non-medical services. I circled waivers and managed care flexibility because these are the areas I'm gonna primarily focus on during the presentation. And these are areas where CMS has recently released um, some new guidance and offered new opportunities to states. Next slide. Thanks. I want to transition now to talking about Section 1115 Waiver Authority, um, but I want to do some level setting first. Uh, this is kind of technical, and so I want to give some basics about what these demonstration waivers are. So next slide. Section 1115 demonstration waivers allow states an opportunity to test new approaches in Medicaid that, um, that differ from traditional federal requirements and allow states to fund services that wouldn't normally be allowed. These waivers must be budget neutral for the federal government, meaning federal costs under the waiver can't exceed what federal costs would have been for the state without the waiver. Some waivers are comprehensive and make broad program changes, while other state waivers may be narrow and address specific populations or benefits. States must conduct independent evaluations of demonstrations to determine their impact and effectiveness. Waivers are generally approved by CMS for a five-year period, then they must be renewed. 
The waiver approval process can be lengthy and involve complex negotiations with CMS. Next slide. Demonstration waivers generally reflect changing priorities from one administration to another, as well as state priorities. The Trump administration's waiver policy emphasized work requirements and eligibility restrictions, payments for institutional behavioral health services, and capped financing. The Biden administration has encouraged states to propose waivers that expand coverage, reduce health disparities, and advance whole person care, um, which is really care that integrates physical, behavioral health, and social needs. Next slide. As part of this administration's focus on reducing health disparities and on, uh, on providing whole person care, in late 2022, CMS announced a new Section 1115 demonstration opportunity to support states in addressing health-related social needs. CMS defines health-related social needs as unmet needs or adverse conditions like housing instability, homelessness, or nutrition insecurity that contribute to poor health. This demonstration opportunity expands flexibility for states to cover certain housing and nutrition supports and allows states to target populations beyond those who meet eligibility criteria for those home and community-based services programs I was talking about previously, and more broadly than in some 1115 demonstrations targeting social determinants in the past. CMS released a framework for state proposals to cover these services under 1115. I've highlighted key takeaways um, on the slide. The framework identifies specific services, um, short-term housing and nutrition supports that will be considered in addition to case management. CMS has outlined several service delivery requirements also on the slide here. Um, an important one, there must be a documented medical need for these services. They must be optional for the enrollee and services must be integrated with existing social services. So CMS is clear that this opportunity and these services need to supplement, not substitute for other existing housing and nutrition supports um, offered federally or by states or, or localities. CMS is implementing fiscal policies as part of this framework as well, including a spending cap um, for what can be spent on these HRSN services and a requirement for states to maintain baseline spending on related social services that they were funding pre-waiver. States must meet certain requirements related to provider rate uh, provider rates to ensure access to basic Medicaid services. Monitoring and evaluation requirements also apply, as I just described on the previous slide. Next slide. The release of the framework um, or this demonstration opportunity follows CMS approval of waivers in several states, including Arkansas, Massachusetts, and Oregon, state examples detailed on this slide. The target populations for the HRSN services vary by state, but in all instances are narrowly defined groups that must meet specified health and social risk criteria. Health criteria for these services often include behavioral health needs or certain high-risk chronic conditions, and social risk factors like homelessness or risk of homelessness or major transitions like release from incarceration or other institutional care. CMS has approved a range of housing and nutrition supports for the, these states within the new framework. This includes pre-tenancy services, which can help individuals prepare for and transition to housing, including covering one-time transition and moving costs, tenancy sustaining services to help individuals maintain housing like eviction prevention, medically tailored and other home delivered meals, CMS also approved some services that be, go beyond what's been approved in the past. In Oregon, CMS approved Medicaid coverage of rent or temporary housing for up to six months for certain high need individuals. Covering rent or temporary housing is notable as it's really not been allowed in the past. In Oregon and Massachusetts, CMS approved medically necessary devices to maintain healthy air temperatures and clean air for certain high risk individuals. In Massachusetts, CMS approved meal support up to six months for an entire household with a child or pregnant person identified as high risk. Not on the slide, but important to highlight, case management services were approved in each state. Oregon and Massachusetts will require managed care plans to provide these services to enrollees who meet the criteria. In Arkansas, the services, the services will be coordinated um, by eligible hospitals. 
Also important to flag, CMS has approved the use of federal funds uh, to build capacity of community-based non-traditional providers that may require technical assistance and infrastructure support to become Medicaid providers. Next slide. I hope the examples I just highlighted help illustrate the types of services and populations included in state demonstrations recently approved by CMS. To wrap up on waivers, I just wanna quickly highlight that we have an 1115 waiver tracker on our KFF website. We track pending and approved waivers and have a table specifically focused on social determinants. I've only scratched the surface in terms of flagging state examples, so I encourage you to check out our tracker. Now that CMS has released this framework, we could see additional states pursue these waivers. Next slide. I wanna to transition to discussing flexibility under Medicaid managed care programs. And just to level set again, nationally, more than two thirds of Medicaid enrollees are enrolled in managed care plans. And as was mentioned um, early in today's webinar, in Ohio, that percent is even higher at about 90%. Next slide. Before I highlight new CMS guidance related to managed care, I wanted to quickly highlight some data about contract requirements from a recent KFF survey of state Medicaid programs. States may include requirements related to enrollee social needs in planned contracts. On a KFF survey of states fielded last summer, we asked states about managed care contract requirements related to social determinants. As you can see on this slide, many states had requirements in place or planned to screen for social and behavioral health needs and to provide enrollees with referrals to social services. We know Ohio has been active in this area and engaged with its managed care plans on performance and outcomes. Not identifiable on this slide, but just wanted to highlight, Ohio Medicaid already requires plans to screen for social and behavioral health needs and provide referrals to social services. Ohio reported planning to implement new managed care requirements in fiscal year 2023 including requiring plans to partner with community-based organizations and requiring plans to reinvest in the community. All right, I see we're running out of time, so I'll be quick here in my last couple of slides. So switching gears, the other area I just wanted to quickly highlight um, in terms of new guidance from this administration is related to in lieu of services. Um, under federal rules, states may allow managed care plans the option to offer services or settings that substitute for standard Medicaid benefits. So, for example, allowing prenatal visits for at-risk pregnant enrollees as an alternative to in-office visits. CMS has issued new guidance related to in lieu of services early this year that expands opportunities for health plans to offer health-related social needs like housing and nutrition supports through this authority. Notably, CMS has clarified these services don't need to be an immediate substitute, but can be preventive in nature. So providing a dehumidifier for a child with asthma before the next time they need emergency care. Just like under the 1115 opportunity, CMS has outlined a number of requirements and guardrails for this opportunity. The key takeaway about this authority is that it creates a new pathway for states to finance health-related services on an ongoing basis. Next slide. California's approval to include health-related services um, through managed care in lieu of authority is a blueprint for what we might see um, approved by CMS and other states. On the slide, I've listed the, the services California has gained approval for to offer under in lieu of authority, including asthma remediation, nutrition, uh, nutrition support, supports to allow people to remain or return to their communities, and um, help with activities of daily living. Next slide. So to wrap up, I know I've covered a lot of technical ground at the outset, um, highlighting the various options states have to address and really social needs and then focusing on recent guidance. Of course, there are considerations for states interested in pursuing similar initiatives that vary by option and also other factors like a state's existing delivery system. We know these initiatives are a big lift for states and implementation is complicated. The success of these initiatives will hinge on states and often managed care plans ability to collaborate across agencies and to work effectively with non-traditional community-based providers. We'll be watching implementation across states that have taken advantage of these new authorities, um, like the 1115 authority in California and the in lieu of authority. We'll be looking to see data related to utilization of these services, as well as outcome evaluations that provide additional insights. 
about whether these initiatives help in reducing disparities and improving health outcomes. Finally, I know we're out of time. I just also wanted to flag there's a lot of interest right now in across states in reentry and pre-release waivers um, uh, for it, folks leaving incarceration. Um, this wasn't the subject of the presentation, but we just flag that we're tracking this activity as well, and it's very closely uh, aligned with our conversation on social determinants. So thanks again for inviting me to join. Happy to field questions uh, in the chat now or after this presentation. Wonderful. Thank, thank you, Libby. And to the extent you can, that would be helpful. As I mentioned earlier, we've gotten quite a lot of questions, and many of them are, are nuanced. So we'll do our best to respond to those. Um, as Adit said earlier, also, if you want to follow up with an email, any participants to either Adit or to me, Amy Rolling mcgee our email addresses are available on our website. Um, and we, we may not know the answer, but we can often refer you to other resources or people who may know the answers to your questions. Um, it, it seems like we have quite a diverse audience uh, in attendance today, um, questions ranging from um, specific questions related to waivers, 1115 waivers, waivers for people with severe and persistent mental illness, um, to questions about redetermination and eligibility. Uh, so there's clearly a high degree of interest in our Medicaid program and learning more about the details of how this program is administered in our state. Um, we, we hope that you have all learned uh, a few new pieces of information from A.D., Patrick, and Libby here this afternoon. We have one more poll question or poll for you with four questions. Um, Alana's gonna pull that up here and we'll give you a moment to respond to those questions. Uh, our hope is that you'll take advantage of the um, resources that we have posted on our website. Um, in addition to Ohio Medicaid Basics, we've linked to several other resources that Adit mentioned in her presentation. And then of course, also the Ohio Department of Medicaid has much information posted on its website. Um, and as well, there is the Ohio Consumer Hotline um, for the Department of Medicaid that you can contact for information about eligibility um, as well. And um, we'll put this on our website. There's a, a system in our state of, of people called navigators who exist to assist people who are interested in knowing more about Medicaid eligibility um, and eligibility for other pub public programs for um, navigating those, those systems. So we'll make sure that there's a link to how you can get in touch with people locally who can assist with your uh, more detailed questions around eligibility. All right, do we have responses to the poll? Uh, okay. We've got a few more slides that. Okay. Um, so this is a slide that we include in many of our presentations. Since we are the Health Policy Institute of Ohio, we always wanted to encourage people to be involved in the policymaking process. Um, right now, we're at the tail end of our state biennial budget process um, with all of the final decisions related to what will be in the state budget being worked out hopefully this week. Um, and, um, but that's not where the policymaking process ends. There's plenty of opportunities for you to work to build relationships with your elected officials at the, the local or state level, um, wherever you live. Um, so please considering, please consider getting involved. Um, our elected officials exist to serve us. They need to hear from us and they want to hear from us. Uh, so here are some ideas about how you might do that. And again, if you have questions about how you can get involved and engaged in the policymaking process, you can reach out to either me or Adit. All right, with all of that in mind, we have another poll question for you. Um, and this is, how likely are you to use the information presented in today's forum 
to influence the policy making process. So if you could please respond to that, we would appreciate it. We've got a few others in here, so please. Okay, oh, there's a few All questions, okay. All right, great. Yep. So thank you for providing that final feedback to us today. Um, thanks for sticking around um, for the entire forum. And we, we hope you have a great rest of the day. Please be safe given the air quality um, and be well. Take care. Bye.